Are we ready? Good evening. I'd like to call to order the council meeting of October 28th. Councilmember Dunbar. Councilmember Garza. Councilmember Hussein. Councilmember Jackson. Councilmember Spadafore. Present. Councilmember Spitzley. Here. Councilmember Washington. Here. Councilmember Wood. Here. There are seven members present at quorum. Councilmember Garza is absent. Uh, with that, uh, we will move into a moment of meditation and pledge. Does anyone on the dais have someone that they'd like uh, remembered at this time? Yes, Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. Just to uh, um, remember uh, Congressman John Conyers, who recently passed um, at the age of 90, longest serving African American in Congress, um, notwithstanding some of the scandal that caused him to resign, he was a great man um, and did great things and I know the world will be a little less um, righteous without him. So if you think about him, I appreciate Thank it. You. Yes, uh, Council Member Hussain. I'd ask that we uh, remember Samuel Horton, uh, Samuel Horton's uh, family. Samuel Horton is uh, an incredible Southwest Lansing advocate. He's a longtime Churchill Downs resident. Uh, he's a member of the Southwest Action Group and really just an all around good guy. He recently lost his life partner, his wife. Uh, so again, I, I ask that we remember him. Okay. Thank you. All right, with that, if we could please rise. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You have for your approval the council proceedings of October 14th. Vice President Spadafore. Madam President, I move the approval of Council proceedings from October 14th, 2019. We have a motion. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Pose passes unanimously. And we are to comments by council members and the city clerk. Council member comments. Council member Washington. Thank you, Madam President. I just quickly want to um, remind or tell folks that we will not be having a first ward constituent meeting this month. It would have been this Saturday, but I have a personal matter I need to tend to, so I am canceling it, and I will send out the email. Thank you. All right, thank you. Council Member Hussein, then Council Member Spitzley. Just a few, sorry, just a few announcements. Uh, first is the Southwest Action Group's first annual trunk or treat uh, event that will be uh, on Halloween, so October 31st, uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. This will be at the site of the forthcoming Town Square. Um, and so that is uh, Pleasant Grove Plaza, adjacent to the Pleasant Grove and Homes District. Uh, there will also be a classic car show, so uh, people that are mobile, please uh, consider making that part of your, um, uh, your stops. Uh, the second uh, piece is that my next constituent contact meeting will be held November 9th. Uh, from 8 to, I'm sorry, from 10 to 12 noon at 5825 Wise Road. That's the Alfreda Schmidt Southside Community Center. Uh, we are fortunate enough uh, to have uh, Chief Daryl Green with us uh, November 9th. Uh, there are a number of public safety concerns that we've been discussing uh, as it pertains to South Lansing, uh, and he has agreed to be with us to discuss those uh, and, and also to discuss um, kind of approach uh, to being, you know, obviously he's a new chief, uh, engagement with the Lansing Police De Department and the like. Uh, and beyond that, um, the Southwest Action Group's next monthly meeting is November 14th at 6 p.m. Uh, this will be at the Southside Community Coalition at 2101 West Holmes. Uh, there are just a myriad of projects uh, that this particular group uh, is exploring and pushing uh, to really kind of advance the Pleasant Grove and Homes District. And so we would uh, certainly encourage uh, anyone interested uh, in attending and, and finding out what that's all about. Thank you. Councilmember Hussein, would you like to announce Councilmember Garza's meeting since he's not here? <coughs> Certain he's having one. Same, is he? same day. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that he was having one. Um, that will be November 9th, uh, 1 to 3 p.m., and it is at the uh, fire station on uh, Miller Road, East Miller Road. 
Thank you. Okay, thank you. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. I just wanted to thank Council and the public for the outpouring of love and support during this time when my dad died. Um, I got cards from constituents, and you know, it's always nice um, when, when folks you know, reach out to you and, and express that support, and I thank you the council members who, who, and clerk who attended. And um, just real quick, you know, my dad clearing out his stuff, treasure trove, he was, he got the bronze star twice for valor. He uh, was a Green Beret. Um, he was a uh, Korean uh, prisoner of war in Korea. Um, he was a marksman. He was a sharpshooter. He was a spy. I mean, we're finding all of this stuff as we were going through his, um, is his uh, information, but he was a true patriot. And he was a patriot at a time where, you know, being a patriot during the Vietnam and the Korean War and being an African American male um, was, was, were, were two things that were not good things. And so I would ask that on Veterans Day, if you just, you know, say a prayer for my dad, um, his like will never come around again. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other uh, council member comments? Um, I wanted to announce there's a series of meetings that the Board of Water and Light is going to be doing as part of their next step um, as their uh, power uh, utility management. And this is part of an IRP program. Uh, these are the dates and the locations for the open houses that they will be having them. November 6th. Wednesday from 4.30 to 7, they will be at uh, the Rio Depot at 1201 South Washington. November 7th from 4.30 to 7, they'll be at the East Lansing Public Library in the large meeting room, and that's at 950 Abbott. On November 13th, Wednesday from 4.30 to 7, they'll be at the Delta Township District Library in the Elmwood Room and that's at 5130 Davenport Drive. November 14th from 4.30 to 7, they'll be at the Elfrida Smith Center in the community room, and that's at 5825 Wise Road. And then the last meeting will be November 19th, Tuesday from 9 a.m. to noon, and that will be at the depot as well. This is an opportunity to talk about um, how they can maintain affordable and reliable uh, power and energy. So with that. Uh, thank you. Uh, just want to make some, uh, this is the last council meeting before the city election coming up uh, next, uh, next Tuesday. Um, so those of you who have been issued an absentee ballot, uh, you have a week to get it back to us. Um, I have about almost 5,000 people who have been issued a ballot that haven't returned it yet, so please uh, make a point to get those back to us. Uh, just a little over a week left, and we do have to receive it by 8 o'clock election night, so as we're getting closer, don't rely on the mail unless you put it in the mail in the next few days. Uh, the mail is taking a little bit longer these days. Um, and if you are planning to vote at the polls, the polls are open from 7 a.m. until 8 o'clock p.m. Uh, next Tuesday. Um, also, just want to remind folks that with uh, Proposal 3 that passed last year, uh, if you're not registered, uh, you can still register in person in my office up uh, until 8 o'clock election night in person, and uh, you just need to bring proof of identity, and if you have photo ID, bring that with you as well. Um, still lots of opportunities for you to, uh, to vote. And with that, we are to community event announcements. Are there any community, uh, community event announcements this evening? Mr. Jackson, I believe you're wanted down at the podium. The Friends of Lansing's Historic Cemetery has had our 5K run walk on October 19th in Mount Hope Cemetery, and that raises money to restore monuments and markers within that cemetery. And our winner at 18 minutes and 8 seconds was Brian T. Jackson, city council person, who unequivocally ran away, pardon the pun, before he could be presented with his trophy and his laurel wreath. So we would like to present that to him now. It's an honor to win the Race to Restore 5K. 
And coming in just two seconds behind him was Cheryl Volk's son, Clay. Hey. So, hey. thank you. Hey. Any other, any other community event announcements? Uh, all right. All right. Seeing none, we are to speaker registration for public comment on legislative matters. And that does include the three scheduled public hearings as well as the items listed on the consent agenda and resolutions for action, uh, ordinances for introduction, and ordinances for passage. And just to let folks know, there are a couple of items listed on the agenda that won't be considered tonight, although uh, you can still. Uh, talk about them if you want. Uh, council will not be considering the nonprofit status for one starfish tonight or the ordinance amending chapter 288 this evening. So if you need to sign in, please jump up right now if you want to speak. Uh, and with that, we are to the mayor's comments. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, this evening is going on on November 2nd. Is your mic on, sir? Sorry. Thank you. It's buried underneath it. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, start over. Um, okay. We have a variety of things going on here in the city of Lansing, as always. Uh, on November 2nd, we have drain day and leaf cleanup in Baker and Fabulous Acres. Uh, this has been in the neighborhood newsletter for the last few weeks. So if you get that, then you've got the info. If you don't, please sign up with our neighborhoods department. Um, it's from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. on the 2nd. Uh, at 538 Isbell, um, and uh, you can sign up online. So folks are welcome to come to that. Uh, on November 6th, we've got our Citizen Academy graduation at 6 p.m. at, um, at SWAC, or the South Washington Office Complex on South Washington. Um, so that's exciting to see all the people who are graduating from our Citizens Academy. Uh, and last, I want to reference um, uh, Tomorrow, I don't know that this is set or announced yet, so you may be hearing it first here. Um, we're going to have a community conversation. Uh, L I take that back. LPD is holding uh, a listening session at uh, on the south side off of Miller Road. Um, there was a, a shooting um, over the weekend uh, and an after hours house party that had been broken up by the police and then gathered again, and there was a shooting. Uh, and uh, one person died and several people were shot and many people in the community down there um, are concerned and LPD is, is responding and they're going to hold a, uh, a session um, to listen to the folks and let me grab the address. It's on Hague Road. Um, it will be at 6294 Hague Road on the south side down by Miller. Um, so anybody who is concerned about those shootings or wants to talk, um, please feel free to attend that listening session. Um, and then finally, uh, tomorrow at 1030, we also have the Peckham Sculpture Dedication uh, out by Peckham by the airport. Um, if you've driven by there, then you've seen the sculpture that's gone up. Uh, and it's beautiful. We were up there at, at Fiddler's uh, last week for uh, the, um, their facade improvement. Um, or no, we were at Paisano's for their facade improvement, and I saw the stat, the, uh, the, the um, sculpture there, and it's gorgeous. So you can come to the dedication tomorrow at 1030 if you are interested in coming on the north side. Um, so that's mostly what's going on. Mr. Mayor, what time, again, was that event, the listening event? The LPD one, I believe it is going to be at 530. 530. And I did not okay. say that, so thank you. 530, 6294 Hague Street okay. um, on the south side down by, um, down by Miller Road. Okay. Um, right. and, and then were you going to make the announcement about the Veterans um, oh. Day information? I was, um, and I wrote it down, and I don't have it. Um, hold on. I can get that. You know what? I don't have it. Um, I will check our website. Um, okay. I will get the information. I have it in my office. And okay. I went down and grabbed everything and forgot that. All right. Thank so, you. Thanks. We'll call back on you again. Okay. <laughs> okay. We are to public comment on legislative matters. And uh, as I indicated, we have three public hearings. Number one is in consideration of Brownfield Plan Number 77, 500 Block Redevelopment Project. Number two is the Michigan Avenue Corridor Improvement Authority Development and Finance Plan, and number three is the Saginaw Street Corridor Improvement Development and Finance Plan. 
Okay, the first one would be, uh, well, all three of them with the council member Hussein. Sure, so all three of these have come out of development and planning. The first is in consideration of Brownfield Plan Number 77, as for the 500 block redevelopment project at 501 South Capitol Avenue and 520 South Washington Avenue. Uh, the applicant in this case uh, is 501 Block LLC and 502 Block LLC. Um, this pertains to uh, two parcels uh, consisting of about 2.8 acres. Um, this is uh, uh, the, Lake, the Lake Trust uh, property, as well as uh, the parcel to the south. The project is a mixed-use, multi-phase, multi-building project. It does include retail, uh, service pro uh, providers, as well as multi-family residential. Phase one, uh, which the brownfield actually pertains to, so this brownfield plan, um, deals with two separate buildings. So building one would be 501 South Capitol Office. This is a renovation of an existing structure. Uh, it would be a mixed-use building with about 24,000 square feet of office and commercial space. Uh, it would be about four floors of residential, and if I'm correct, I believe um, that consists of uh, 44 apartments, which four would be studio, 28 would be one bedrooms, and 12 would be two bedrooms. Uh, the construction period that's stated in the Brownfield plan, I believe, is November of 2019 to August of 2021. And then building two would actually be a new build. Uh, so that would be along South Capitol Avenue and West Hillsdale. Uh, there would be about 3,500 square feet of commercial space and about 116 residential apartments. Uh, the configuration would be 12 studios, uh, 71 bedrooms, and 34 two bedrooms. Uh, site demo is scheduled to begin September 20th and completed by May of 22nd. Phase two, uh, which would consist of a mixed use building along Washington Avenue and Lenawee um, is, is contingent on the success of uh, phase one. Um, the total investment is $31.2 million. In terms of the eligible activities, um, there is demolition, lead and asbestos abatement, infrastructure improvement, site prep activities. It does include a 15% contingency as well as 3% um, on, on loans. Uh, the eligible activities including Lansing Brown uh, Field Redevelopment Authority, Administration, Lansing Brownfield Revolving Fund, and Michigan uh, Brownfield Redevelopment Fund um, equates to $11,024,756 in eligible capture, of which uh, just under $10 million uh, would be reimbursed to the developer. There's a 10% pass through, um, so we will see uh, new taxes to uh, all local taxing units. Um, the, the length of the tax capture is 19 years, it's capped at 23. Um, and we talked quite a bit about price points and things of that nature at the uh, introduction and the setting of the public hearing, so I'll skip that aspect. Uh, in terms of number two, this is in consideration of the Michigan Avenue Corridor Improvement Authority Development and Finance Plan. Uh, the Michigan Avenue Corridor Improvement Authority was actually approved back in 2009. Um, the purpose uh, from the outset has basically been to prevent and reverse deterioration of a, a incredibly critical corridor uh, to the city of Lansing. Uh, state statute does allow for a development plan as well as a finance plan. Uh, and the, really the, the primary tool in terms of the finance plan is the, uh, tax increment financing. There are other uh, revenue generating initiatives that are uh, spelled out in the plan. Uh, which includes grants and uh, donations, sponsorships, fees, and things of that nature. Uh, the development plan uh, really identifies three focus points um, related to projects, and that's public infrastructure uh, projects. Uh, and just a couple of examples, actually I'll just give you one example of each. Um, Short-term installed bicycle racks and related equipment, especially near transit stations such as bus stops. Uh, the second is correction uh, and prevention of deterioration, an example of a project that's spelled out in the Development plan would be to organize efforts to clean and beautify corridor. Uh, and the third area is the promotion of neighborhood uh, neighborhood aligned economic growth projects. Uh, and an example of that would be uh, to create a marketing and bra uh, branding plan for the corridor. Uh, the board of directors did meet and approve this development and TIF plan on August 27th. We were lucky enough to have uh, board chair Brian Lum with us um, in development and planning as well as uh, uh, city council uh, where we introduced and set the public hearing. Uh, this is a 15 year plan and much, um, much in the same way the Saginaw Street Corridor Improvement Authority uh, was also uh, put together to prevent reverse deterioration of again a very critical corridor uh, and that was in 2009 as well. Uh, the development plan, uh, much like with the um, Michigan Avenue Corridor Improvement Authority's uh, plan, was um, worked on over a number of years. There was a ton of community engagement. Uh, the board chair, Jonathan Lucko, uh, did present to development and planning as well as this body. Uh, the three focal points are complete streets, transit-oriented, and traditional neighborhoods. Um, 
the just a few of the projects there will be um, and, and some of these they're hoping to get done actually in the first year uh, installation of bike racks receptacles benches uh, inventory existing business and engages or I'm sorry existing businesses and engage um, pursue grant funding for future development projects the promotion of corridor uh, and the development of the authority's webpage, uh, really kind of working on the communication strategy uh, of the Corridor Improvement Authority. Uh, again, plans were approved by the Board of Directors at the August 27th meeting, uh, 5-0. That's it. All right, thank you. Okay, um, before I call the speakers, let me first uh, recognize that we have three letters in support of the Michigan Avenue Corridor Improvement uh, Plan uh, from Neogen, Sparrow Hospital, and uh, the Keppel Region Community Foundation. And then the first speaker uh, is Lewis Hanft, followed by uh, William Pettit. And as he's coming to the podium, just very quickly, I do want to recognize that we have Carl Dorschmer as well as Han Hannah Bryant from the, uh, the Lansing Economic Area Partnership. We appreciate you guys being here. Thank you. Sir. Hello, my name is Lewis Hanft. I'm here today in regards to a uh, claim number 1740 uh, on 214 Lathrop Street in Lansing. Uh, this is an investment property that I own. Um, this is a vacant lot next to 210, uh, which I had residence in. Um, so the reason I'm here today is because uh, uh, upon trying to pay my taxes, I was told that there's a $3,140 fine associated with tree debris on the site, which I was not aware of. Um, now. Obviously, some of you are noticing my shirt. Uh, I own and operate one of the most successful and reputable tree service companies in the greater Lansing area, and I have for six years. Uh, we've done um, a tremendous amount of work for not only the county, uh, but also the drain commissions and even uh, individuals such as uh, Mayor Shore there and his personal property. So um, the reason I bring that to light is simply because this is not an issue due to neglect or to not uh, being prompt on the issue. I was just simply not aware of it. Uh, when I bought this parcel from Tony Schmidt Realty and did the property transfer affidavit, uh, I gave my personal address of, uh, at the time, I believe it was uh, in Eaton Rapids, and never did I receive anything regarding the matter whatsoever. Um, I called and I asked where the form was sent to, and they told me 214 Lathrop Street. Now 214 Lathrop Street is a vacant lot. Uh, so again, no way of me seeing or getting uh, that notice. It, had I got it, I would have simply brought my crew out, removed anything necessary, and been on my way. Uh, so the reason I'm here tonight, I missed this morning's uh, meeting as I was already at work, but my goal is to hopefully find a way to resolve this case uh, without being fined $3,140 um, for something that would have taken my crew and I 15 to 20 minutes to um, fix. Uh, it's the first time I've ever been in any kind of meeting like this, so forgive me if, uh, you know, if it's not as formal as it normally would be, uh, but just want to thank you all for hearing me out. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask me, uh, but that's, that's pretty much all I have to say. All right. Thank you, sir. Yes, ma'am. All right. Thank you. Next, we have William Pettit and then Bob Pena. Pettit is oh, first. Oh, oh. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, William Pettit, uh, 616 Westmoreland, uh, three doors down from Saginaw. Uh, I'm here to support the Saginaw Street uh, uh, corridor authority, uh, but I had a couple of uh, concerns and uh, some questions that I think um, probably are better addressed to the authority, but I just wanted to raise them here. Um, first, um, I hope that the authority will not spend a lot of money on uh, consultants and advisors. Uh, the, the simple truth of the matter is that the problem with the Saginaw corridor is the speed limit, um, the lack of parking, um, the uh, inaccessibility of the businesses because of the speed limit. I mean, it's after 10 o'clock at night, it literally is Daytona 500 along there. So. Um, I hope that that uh, issue is addressed by the authority because that's, that's the bottom line. Um, the second consideration I hope that is addressed and whether this is through tax uh, um, 
uh, in, uh, savings or, or uh, tax credits or whatever is the number of vacant buildings on the uh, on the strip. It's just um, you know it's vacant building after vacant building, and that really needs to be addressed. Um, my other concern is that um, a lot of the board members of the authority are uh, business people, and I think that um, the uh, authority should have been skewed towards uh, residents. Uh, there may be, I think by statute, one of them is a resident, but I think uh, the resident should be more heavily involved in uh, the planning process. A couple of concerns I have is first, has there been any accumulation of historical data as to whether there will be uh, in increases in property tax such that there will be some capture? In other words, will there be any money to put towards projects? Um, so that is uh, my first question and concern. And then my second one would be, um, and I didn't see this in the act, but are any of the taxing agencies, such as the community college, the, the county, are they able to opt out? In other words, how much money is going to be available for this project or for these projects? So those are my two concerns. I'm, I'm very happy that Saginaw Street is uh, becoming a, uh, or at least has, has come forward as a public issue, and uh, I wish the authority all the success in the world, but uh, they've got, a, they've got a, a, long, a big hill to climb. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. The next speaker is Bob Pena and then Chris Roloffs. Uh, first of all, uh, apologies to Mr. Pettis. Okay. <laughs> Overzealous a, a little bit. Um, my name is Bob Pena. I reside at 2100 Vine Street in uh, the east side. Um, I've been in discussion with a few businesses on the 6,000 block and also the 2,000 block. Um, there is a concern with parking. Um, as these developments are going up, uh, especially in the six, like where the Myers project is in the 600 block. So I just want to make that a, uh, known to the council people that that is an issue of concern with a few businesses in the 600 block of the stadium district. And also in the 2000 block, there's also uh, changed traffic patterns at already as we speak. Um, in the last week or so, there have been uh, large buses and semis going through the neighborhood streets, uh, just breaking up branches. So. Sir. Are, are you talking to... But this is in relation to the Michigan Avenue Court. project. Okay, yeah. I just want to make sure Yes. That, that so, and um, I'll just keep it... It's parking oh. and traffic issues are a concern. Um, as a resident that uses bicycle lanes, thank you, Commissioner... I'm sorry, uh, City Council person, Hussein, for the bike facilities that are planned for Michigan Avenue. That's, that's needed and appreciated. And thank you for your service, and thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Chris Roloffs and then Jim Herbert. Uh, good evening. My name is Chris Roloffs. I uh, own a restaurant on Michigan Avenue. Uh, I wanted to speak in relation to the Michigan Avenue development project. Uh, uh, I don't know that what my comments will be relevant to what's being discussed tonight, but I wanted to make them in either case. Um, I wanted to initially say that I'm a new to the area and new to, of, new to discovering the Michigan Avenue development project. And I think it's a wonderful idea. I am uh, thrilled by the idea of uh, restoring the area, putting more, somewhat more green spaces in, uh, better bike and uh, bus access. Um, that being said, I do have one concern that I wanted to bring forward, and that is that I believe the plan is predicated on the reduction of Michigan Avenue to a single lane in either direction. Uh, you know, some of the businesses that may not adversely affect, but for those of us in the hospitality industry, that would certainly um, hurt us if traffic is diminished. And it would also hurt us if transit times are increased. Uh, we do do a significant lunch business as well as some at happy hour. Both of those would be disrupted by anything that diverted traffic to my presumption would be um, either Mount Hope or Saginaw. And so I just wanted to bring that forward to the council and uh, um, make it known that uh, there are some of us that have concerns about um, the potential reduction and uh, really the uh, the increase in bus and bike traffic might contribute to that as well. Um, I have a mixed mind about that because I certainly think that would be a admirable and uh, beneficial thing to cultivate, but just from the perspective of a business owner um, in the area, there are 
there are certainly some concerns about uh, anything that would either reduce traffic volume or um, increase transit times. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next is Jim Herbert and then Mary Reynolds. Well, I'm Jim Herbert. Uh, I reside in a historical home at 1704 Jerome Street and also own the property at 120 Marshall. That's a home that was built in the late 1800s that we restored. I further appear tonight as chairman of the board of Neogen Corporation, a worldwide food safety company that has its world headquarters within less than a half mile of the Michigan corridor. We employ over 650 people here in Lansing who work within a half a mile of Michigan Avenue, and many of them reside in the same corridor. I cautiously support the continuation of the corridor plan, but I am concerned about the damages that it may cause to the surrounding neighborhoods. I believe that we should uh, be especially cautious not to have Michigan Avenue be a concrete canyon with high-rise apartment buildings extending from sidewalk to property line. This is damaging for a number of reasons. Case in point would be the corner property at Michigan Avenue and Marshall Street, which adjoins my two properties. The current developer proposes to erect a four-story apartment building. I believe the developer's plan is detrimental to the city and its residents for a number of reasons. First, uh, Marshall Street is a main connector between Grand River and Michigan Avenue and doesn't need another tall building with numerous parking issues right where the traffic pours into Michigan. Marshall serves as a pedestrian and automobile traffic for four schools that are in the area. Uh, from a selfish standpoint, uh, such a building would block the sunlight from our homes. I'd no longer be able to look out my bedroom window and see daylight, but instead will look into the bedrooms of dozens of apartments. A prior developer had uh, planned uh, a two-story building on this site and with connections uh, back to the neighborhood uh, a bit of green space, wrought iron fence, and so on. This would have been uh, an extension of Marshall Avenue back into the historical districts behind it. The new developer has changed the plan to four stories, which would push to the property lines and I believe have inadequate parking. The reason for the change is that the four-story structure will be more profitable. Of course, I'm certainly not blind to profits. Uh, the company that we started here 37 years ago is now public and has a market capitalization value of over $3 billion. Neogen has purchased, restored, and used his uh, 20 buildings in this same area of the city, and in each case, we did so to help the community and with the resident support. I make, a, in closing, I make a plea to the committee, to city council, to the mayor's staff, and the would-be developers uh, not to build concrete canyons to block the sunlight from the historic surrounding neighborhoods they're also going through continual improvements. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and next is Mary Reynolds who passes. So we are to the referral of the public hearings. Uh, all three public hearings will go back to Development and Planning Committee. Then we are to the consent agenda. Vice President Spadafore. Madam President, the only item left on the consent agenda will be the item under one, which is a tribute and recognition of Karen Deanna Sturdivant. All right, we have a um, motion on the table, the consent agenda. Are there any questions, concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. We are to the Committee on Development and Planning. Council Member Hussein. The first item before us is uh, an obsolete property rehabilitation act or an OPRA district for ANC holdings for property at 1611 East Kalamazoo Street. Uh, we had a public hearing on this October 4th. Um, all comments seem to be supportive. The applicant in this case is ANC Holdings LLC, which is a nonprofit subsidiary of Allen Neighborhood Center. Uh, the reason for the request is that um, they did obtain this property in 2018 uh, after working very hard over a number of years uh, to figure out a pathway to ownership. Uh, and they're looking to redevelop the property by rehabbing the two-story complex, uh, adding a third floor along Kalamazoo Street, and then they want to do three-story additions of both the east and, and the west end. Um, in total, they're looking at about 50,000 square feet of space, 30,000 square feet of residential, and 20,000 square feet of commercial space. In terms of the residential, uh, they're looking to construct 29 um, apartments, uh, which are considered mixed income apartments. And then with regards to the commercial, uh, they currently, the Allen Neighborhood Center, uh, the incubator kitchen uh, that has been discussed quite a bit, 
um, at this dais, uh, as well as Hap and Dance uh, is positioned on the first floor. They will be adding to that um, by adding an accelerator kitchen, uh, which will be for graduates of the incubator, uh, as well as they are looking uh, right now at potentially partnering with the ISD uh, on culinary arts programming. Uh, this property has been uh, determined to be uh, obsolete uh, based on a myriad of factors. Uh, this was constructed over about a 40-year period, and if you've ever been to the site, um, it's, it's very obvious. I mean, you can actually see the different construction phases. And so uh, floor plan is, is convoluted. There's all kinds of um, issues with ceiling heights and things of that nature. Uh, they do need to look at the heating and cooling systems. Uh, it's absolutely outdated. Uh, phase one to determine that uh, contamination exists. Uh, there were uh, prior uses such as gas stations and dry cleaners, things of that nature. Uh, the applicant would like to begin demo and pretty much immediately uh, after this district uh, is actually created. Um, they understand that uh, by approving an OPRA district, that in no way means that uh, this um, council uh, will approve an OPRA certificate. They have to go through the process just like everybody else. Uh, but with that being said, um, I would move the Obsolete Property Rehabilitation Act uh, district for ANC Holdings for the property at 1611 East Kalamazoo Street. We have a motion on the floor. Are there any questions or concerns? Council Member Washington. Uh, thank you, Madam President. I don't have any questions or concerns, but I would encourage my colleagues that with this project, um, we all know this is totally an obsolete building, and um, but this has been an issue to bring energy and positive um, housing on the east side, particularly on the Kalamazoo corridor. Um, we have Neogen, we have, we'll be having the uh, Allen Market Place. And this is exciting because as our population is aging, we need more aging in place housing and this will fit that need. This is mixed income. There will be very affordable units and um, most of the units pretty much are spoken for. <laughs> so I mean this is how excited everybody is. And this will enable our seniors who are who have lived on the east side for many years to remain on the east side at an affordable price. So whatever we can do to get this forward, those of us on the east side would appreciate it. Thank you. Are there any other questions or concerns? Councilmember Dunbar. I was just gonna say, and thankfully it's on the north side of the street so it won't block any sunlight to Neogen. <laughs> Are there any other questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye, opposed, passes unanimously. Councilmember Hussein. The second item before us is a Obsolete Property Rehabilitation Act certificate uh, this time. The district uh, was actually established back in 2007. Uh, and this is for Blackboard District LLC for property at 1030 South Holmes uh, Street. So obviously this is the property that uh, served as Holmes Street School uh, starting in 1925. Uh, starting in about 2007, it has a pretty complicated history. Uh, Spartan Internet did um, receive a OPA district and certificate from this council back in 2007. Uh, they were unable to bring that development across uh, the goal line. The district remains, um, but the certificate uh, was revoked earlier this year. Uh, Blackboard District LLC did um, uh, come into possession, I believe it was uh, this past May, uh, and they are looking to convert the three-story structure into 41 uh, studio and one-bedroom apartments. Um, the building is incredibly old. Uh, obviously, the obsolescence uh, was established via a myriad of issues as well. Uh, the rehab will include electrical, plumbing, and HVAC overhaul, uh, roof repairs, new kitchen cabinets and countertops, drywall, flooring, masonry repairs, asphalt and landscaping, uh, and more. The OPRA certificate being considered is a 12-year certificate. Um, that is the max allowed per, uh, per state statute. Uh, they are looking to begin uh, construction in the spring of 2019. They're looking to conclude by June of 2021. We do have Jeff Dehan uh, with uh, Blackboard District LLC with us. Um, I apologize. We actually moved this out of committee before he arrived, so I didn't have an opportunity um, uh, to discuss this earlier. But if there are any questions, he is, he is here. Uh, with that being said, I would move the um, OPRA certificate for Blackboard District LLC for property at 1030 South Home Street. Are there questions or concerns? Councilmember Washington. Again, I have no questions or concerns, but I, again, I would ask my colleagues to look at this seriously. This building has been vacant for a number of years and in communication with the neighborhood organization and the neighborhood leaders, they are very excited about this project. Although it is considered to be market rate apartments, it's market rate for the area. So it will, the price point will fit in nicely in the neighborhood where they are being built. These are not going to be high-end apartments in the middle of a working class neighborhood. So I need to make that clear. Um, and 
correct me if I'm wrong, but um, they have agreed also to keep the green space and to provide park area for the surrounding neighborhood as they have been using it in the past and they have very vibrant uh, neighborhood activities such as Easter egg hunts. So the neighborhood is extremely grateful for, for that aspect of the pro project also. Okay, are there any other questions? Uh, again, I need to see a nod from the developer. You are looking at keeping the green space, is that correct? Pardon? That's correct, okay, thank you. All right, um, any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye, opposed, passes unanimously. Council Member Hussein. So we have a couple public hearings to set. The first is the setting of a public hearing in consideration of Brownfield Plan Number 75, Capital City Market Brownfield Redevelopment Project at 636 East Michigan in a portion of 119 South Large Street. Um, any, anybody that is here to present on this, I'm going to ask that you come down uh, to the well because I'm assuming that there's more than just Carl. Uh, with that being said, very quickly as you come on down, um, if you will recall that Council approved a $10.4 million 30-year uh, Brownfield Plan uh, in November of last year. It was tied to uh, about $42 million in private investment uh, to bring apartments and a grocery store and a hotel uh, to the 600 block of um, Michigan Avenue. With that being said, um, there have been some things that have precipitated the need to amend the Brownfield plan. Uh, and so we are going to get a quick presentation on that. Um, it's actually a pretty uh, simple request. Uh, doesn't change uh, the, the number in terms of eligible uh, uh, reimbursement uh, to the developer. Uh, but with that being said, it is, it is a change and it needs to be vetted uh, past this body. So with that being said, I would assume we're gonna start with Carl, he'll do introductions and then we'll move on. And the plan is in your folders. Carl, please, thank you. Thank you. This plan was before the council once before and it was approved. Uh, as you know, the project is well underway. It's a great project hotel, apartments, and a downtown grocery store. But in the course of their construction, they have discovered that they need to add just a small, tiny sliver of land to the Brownfield plan in order for them to be able to do additional activities. But I wanna stress that none of the numbers in the plan have changed at all. All this does is just add one little piece into the plan. But I'd like to introduce to you, have Jason Kilday, who's with Gillespie Group, and then also Jessica DeBone, who is with PM Environmental. And uh, Jason can give you a little update on the project, and then Jessica can tell you, you know, how the plan has been amended. So, Jason? Jason, and make sure the green light is on, sir. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Council, for hearing us on this. Uh, the 600 project, uh, 600 East Michigan Capital City Market Project is well underway at this point. Uh, we are now, we've had the podium built, and we're starting to frame some of the apartments. I think this week you'll start to see some of the hotel get framed above that too. Obviously lots of site work, demolition has already occurred. As we got into our footing and foundations of this project, um, we found that our, our lot line was very close to that of the Liskey's building to the south, and uh, there was really no feasible way to get our foundations in without expending a lot of money. So we worked with uh, Mr. Carpenter and the Liskey's team and bought a small sliver. So that's what brings us here for the Brownfield Amendment, if you will, tonight. Um, but overall, uh, progress is going good. We're still on track to have the, the building completed by late summer next year. Turn it over to Meyer. Hopefully they're open by mid to late uh, September and the hotel to follow sometime before uh, the end of the year. Apartments will open when the Meyer opens as well. So just for clarification, what we're talking about is adding to the description of the brownfield, this additional sliver of land. That's correct. Uh, if you look in the plan, there's a legal yeah, description. Orange. That's correct. And the orange section. They've added that small. It's about 0 .06 acres of land. It's very small. All right. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so that's correct. It's about 0 .06 acres of land being added to the plan, ultimately just to ensure that the legal description of the property in question that was approved originally matches what it is now today. Um, there will be some eligible activities taking place on that portion of the property, so we also just want to make sure that we're in compliance when we eventually submit for reimbursement. 
Are there any questions, Council Member or Vice President Spadafore? Not really about the plan, but I noticed in the renderings there is a blimp. Is the Gillespie Group investing in a blimp? <laughs> if you talk to Pat, I'm sure he Okay, will. very good. Thank you. Are there other questions? Seeing none, uh, Council Member Hussein. The, the public hearing um, as set forth in the resolution would be for November 18th. So I would move that we set a public hearing in consideration of Brownfield Plan Number 75 as amended, uh, Capital City Market Brownfield Redevelopment Project. Uh, again, that would be November 18th at 7 p.m. on the 10th floor of City Hall. All right, we have a motion. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. So we'll see you at the public hearing. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, Council Member. We'll very Hussain. quickly change out our presenters. Uh, so if I could have the folks that are here to discuss Brownfield Plan Number 78, uh, come on down to the well. This uh, is in the consideration of setting a public hearing uh, for Brownfield Plan Number 78, the Temple Redevelopment Project at 502 East Caesar E. Chavez Avenue. Uh, we already have one public hearing um, scheduled for November 18th uh, because we have two processes kind of taking place concurrently. Uh, we had a Brownfield Plan uh, that was approved by Council, I believe it was in 2009, Brownfield Plan Number 45, uh, and that was for uh, officially, I believe it was called the Old Town Temple Building Rehab Project. Uh, that project was never executed. Uh, the um, Michigan Community Capital um, Group did purchase this uh, in February. They desire to add retail and office space and things of that nature um, to what many um, refer to as the Old Temple Club. Uh, so with that being said, um, we are going to have Carl again introduce our presenters and we will discuss uh, Brownfield Plan Number 78. Carl. Thank you. Uh, the Temple Club building, most of you are familiar with, uh, it's been vacant for quite some time as a, as a Beautiful building on the north side of Lansing, but it's a very challenging building because it was built for a specific purpose. And at one time it was a nightclub, but that was a long time ago. There's, it was purchased by a developer who tried on several occasions to put a deal together, but ultimately could not. Uh, there was a Brownfield plan approved. There was an Oprah approved by this council. But both of those, the Oprah has been revoked and the Brownfield plan itself will be terminated so that we can kind of wipe the wiped the table clean, and now uh, Michigan Community Capital, formerly known as the Michigan Magnet Fund, they have a lot of experience throughout the state doing mixed-use development, and they've purchased the building, and they have plans to turn it into you know, a, a, great, a, a great development in an area that really needs it. And so they've come to us, and we, we've worked with them, put together this Brownfield plan. There's a lot of challenges to the building, but the plan they've come up with it's not a um, historical preservation, but it keeps the histor historical features of the building. You'll see in the handout that it looks a lot the same, but they're increasing the, the utility of the building, the functionality of the building to make it really work in terms of making the space usable. So uh, we put the plan together. The plan was presented to the committee, and I'd like to introduce to you um, two folks we have here tonight. The first is Marilyn Crowley and she represents the Michigan Community Capital. And then we have Dave Van Heron, who's with Triterra. And uh, Marilyn can give you a, a little overview of the project, and then Dave can outline the Brownfield plan. So, Marilyn? Thank you. Okay. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, so I work with Michigan Community Capital. We're a nonprofit um, CDFI and CDE, Community Development Entity, Community Development Finance Institution. Um, so we uh, lend to uh, community development projects and invest in community development projects as well as develop them. Um, so we saw this building um, and as a nonprofit, we're able to take uh, significantly below market rate returns. And so that's um, one reason we're able to do it is because we don't have to make market rate returns. Um, so what we're planning on doing here is um, basically removing the mezzanine that exists on the second floor and infilling that with four floors of apartments. Um, it, it, there's a lot of volume in there, especially in the attic space. There's um, like between seven and 11 feet in the attic. And so we're actually removing that structure and building a new structure inside of it. Um, we're building 31 apartments and then the first floor will be uh, an office suite, which will include our offices as well as additional office space available for rent and um, a commercial space on the corner. So we're actually um, increasing uh, the glazing on um, 
the that'd be the corner of Cedar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, so that it'll be more desirable for retail. Um, and then we're also doing a parking ramp to increase the parking density. Um, I think that's all I have to say. Uh, we, like Carl said, we are not doing a, um, like a historic tax credit project um, just because that would be prohibitive. We would have to keep that second floor to be open and there, there's not a lot of great uses for that space. Um, but we are keeping the large windows. They will no longer be stained glass, but um, kind of those big arched windows will still be there. Um, and all of the beautiful um, entryway features will remain, as well as the second floor um, staircase going up. We'll, so we'll keep a lot of the shape of the building, but make it more usable for apartments. Okay. So on the brownfield, um, the property qualifies as a <coughs> eligible property due to its status as being functionally obsolete. Uh, in addition, there's uh, asbestos and lead-based paint that exists within the building structure itself. Um, the, when looking at eligible brownfield activities associated with this property, we estimate that the eligible activities exceed 2.5 million. Uh, what we're proposing is a maximum of 30-year plan, and that would allow for capture and reimbursement of, uh, would be limited to 2.1 million for reimbursement to the developer. The majority of that cost would be for the vertical parking structure. So it's gonna be a two-story parking structure that would accommodate 51 parking spaces. Um, also, it would cover demolition activities, asbestos abatement, and lead abatement. The, um, of the 2.1 million in capture uh, for reimbursement, uh, let me back up, there'd be a total of $2.8 million of new taxes generated from this investment, from this project. With the $2.1 million in reimbursement to the developer, there would be 89000 that would go towards the state brownfield revolving fund, and then 79000 that would go towards the, for brownfield administration, and then deposits into the local brownfield fund for use on other projects. Um, with that, there would be with the 10% pass through on the 30 year plan, 424,000 would be new taxes that would not be captured as part of this project. So even though we've, um, we've got costs that exceed what's allowed under the plan, we still are adhering to the city's policy for that 10% pass through. And then we're not applying any interest on the Brownfield um, TIF plan itself at all. So it does include a 15% contingency to allow us some flexibility there, but we're not applying any interest on our plan. Um, there's a presentation here that outlines in more detail as far as the specific eligible activities, but again, that's for the environmental assessment, uh, the, uh, including asbestos and lead assessments and abatement, demolition, some site prep activities, and then a majority of it's going towards the parking structure itself. Are there uh, questions um, at this time? Uh, Council Members Spitzley and Vice President Spadafore. Thank you, Madam President. Um, in your presentation, you said that um, you're not including the interest, is that what you said? Mm -hmm. And that your costs exceed um, more than what you're asking for, but you're asking for a 30 year. Mm -hmm. So uh, do, is, that the, is that the maximum 30 years that you're gonna that ask is the for? Maximum. Right. So what um, there, I'm assuming then it's because the project doesn't work if it's less than 30 years? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Vice President Spadafore. Um, good luck, first of all. Um, and then secondly, I really appreciated um, some of the, what you talked about in terms of the historical nature of it, but also the density in parking. That's something we've kind of talked about here is we don't need more parking lots in, in the city. And I appreciate the, the effort to try and include it all on site in as condensed space as possible. And again, good luck. Thank you. Are there other questions at this time? Uh, Council Member Washington. Um, I just think it should be added that we did ask in committee if this was under the new Universal Development Agreement, and it is so correct. Mm -hmm. And, and so the executive order that the mayor put in place will be um, applied to this development. 
there are other questions? My question would be, who is going to own this development? Sure, so um, the LLC, Lansing Acquisitions 500 LLC, will be the owner, and that will be owned by Michigan Community Capital. Which is a nonprofit. Correct. So how does that work for the taxes? I think our nonprofit status doesn't affect our um, property taxes. Um, we, we pay property taxes on all of our properties. Okay, all right. Um, are these market rate or are these um, uh, are these market rate? Yes. Okay. And what's your price point? We have a range between seven hundred dollars a month all the way up to sixteen hundred dollars. Okay. And I think Carl, I asked you whether the Cedar Street School whether that was fully occupied. Yeah, I haven't had a chance to get an answer on that, but your, your question is, it's a commercial building. I know, so, but they're going to have commercial terms of, space right next to it. So Yeah, I haven't got an answer for you, but I can get it for you. Okay, if you would, please. Thank yep. you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member of Washington. Ma'am, correct me. Did you not say in committee that you are actually going to be moving your offices onto the first floor? Correct. So we'll be the anchor tenant on the first floor, but we're not a very big organization. So we'll take um, three or four office suites, and then the rest will be um, available for lease. But I would say in total, there would probably only be between four and six small office suites. So it's not a ton of um, space available. And we are um, preliminarily talking with a tenant for the retail already. Um, we don't have anything signed yet, but um, we hope to have most of that space accounted for before we start construction. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, Councilmember Hussein. So again, and, and I really appreciate the question pertaining to the, the price points. One of the things that we've tried to do, and I think it actually started with uh, Councilman Jackson's predecessor, Jessica Yorko, uh, who started asking the question development and planning, but really wanting to highlight kind of the diversity uh, as we bring in uh, new housing into the city of Lansing, the diver diversity of housing uh, in terms of type, in terms of price point. So, um, you know, I know on my time on council, we brought in low income and affordable, uh, what we call workforce uh, residential apartments, which is what this would be, and higher end. Um, so certainly appreciate that, that line of questioning. But with that being said, I would move that we set a public hearing in consideration of Brownfield Plan number 78 for uh, November 18th at 7 p.m. All right, we have a motion before us. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we are to the Committee on General Services. Council Member Washington. Thank you, Madam President. The first thing we have before us is the resolution regarding, um, <coughs> excuse me, the claim disposition claim 1740 from Lewis Hampt, who we just heard of, heard from. $3,140 for trash violations at 214 North Lathrop Street. And what we were told at committee, we did have the um, department head from code compliance at our committee meeting. And what he uh, said to us was the property was cited for the trees that were cut down and left on the property on October 30th, 2018. The notice was sent to the taxpayer of record at the time the owner of the property listed his address at 214 Lathrop. The owner of this property did not update his address with the assessor until August of this year and also has not paid the winter 2018 and summer 2019 taxes. Um, by ordinance, the office is required to send all notifications to the taxpayer of record. The owner of this property owns a tree cutting service and should have been aware after the trees were cut down that they could not be left on the property. Um, the violations were on the property for at least 20 days from the time their office was sent notification to the time of the contractor showed up. This office, their office recommends denial of the claim. We did, um, we are recommending denial of the claim. Um, and as I said, we had only Mr. Sanford's input because the claimant was not there to offer any information. So with that, I would move the resolution to deny the claim. Um, Vice President Spadafore and Council Member Dunbar. I'm sorry for the questions. I know you I talked about this in committee, but uh, of the $3,140, how much of this is penalties and interests? 
Pardon? How much of this is penalties and interest? Uh, um, $265 is the only, okay. um, is the um, administrative fee. fee. The rest is the trash fee. Councilmember Dunbar. And the trash fee is solely for the logs? Yes. Okay, so I have a couple questions. First, who who cut the logs to begin with? Do you know? We, we had no under, we did not know who cut the trees. All we know is the trees were there and they were cited. Okay, well, I'm just gonna throw out there based on yeah, go ahead. other council members and other people in the public's experience that the Board of Water and Light cuts trees down all the time and leaves the logs where they sit forever. We don't cite them. We don't cite the property where that was done. So I have concern that we're gonna hold a citizen to a different standard than we've ever held the board for any kind of tree removal and leaving the logs sit. Um, the other thing is I don't know, I don't, I don't know the date that um, he purchased the house, but um, we, we have, it's a okay, vacant property. Most people when they do buy a house, they have to do a like a property transfer affidavit that's signed over to the assessor and that's done through the closing. Um, and I don't know how this was purchased, but I'm not sure necessarily that knowing to notify the assessor of the change in the ownership, because we have we used to have people that came through it, I remember this years ago, where the two systems weren't talking to each other from code and there would be a violation at the time that you bought something, but you didn't know it at the time that you closed with the realtor and then the thing is there, so I don't, I don't know what the date of the purchase was or if the purchase was around the time of this. I don't, can we, can we ask these questions? Could he answer my, them? My, my inclination would be to say, you know, allow the claim if I get the right answers. My recommendation would be since the uh, claimant was not there um, at the meeting, that if the um, chair of the committee is willing to pull this claim to invite him back and hopefully he will show up at, at that meeting um, so that the discussion, some of those questions can be answered. Council Member Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. Well, I think that's generous to give him the opportunity to come back. So I think some questions need to be, um, did he cut the trees down or was it a, you know, what, what, what precipitated the cutting down of these trees? That's the first thing. And who owned the property at the time? But I, I, I agree. I mean, I, I um, you know, when the Board of War enlightened, thank God they did. They came through and they cut down a number of trees. They left the logs where they lay. My neighbors have had logs in their backyard for two years. Um, huge, big chunks of logs. And, and so that, that's a concern for me that, so I, I, I would, when we when we bring it back, those are kind of some of the questions I'd like to know: is who cut them down, and yeah, some of the and the same concerns that um, Councilmember Dunbar has. So, with that, Councilmember Washington. Madam President, I'm happy to withdraw this uh, okay. motion for tonight, and um, I would let Mr. Hamp know that we really would like to see you at the committee. It will be um, November 18th, 8 a.m. right here. So that should give you plenty of time to be able to adjust your schedule and we can get those questions answered. So I am happy to do that. All right, thank you. Council Member Washington, your next item. Um, the next item we have before us is a resolution for the fireworks display for Silver Bells, November 22nd. The fireworks will be um, lit in a vacant lot behind the um, Capitol. I think it's a big old parking lot. And um, all of the appropriate sign signatures have been um, received. So with that, I would move the resolution to approve the fireworks for Silver Bells. All right, we have a motion. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Uh, Council Member. Uh, We're to the Committee on Public Safety. Council Member Hussein. All right, we are looking to set a show cause hearing in consideration of orders to make safe or demolish. This is for 818 Nip Avenue. This actually only deals with the, the garage structure at this property. The original red tag date uh, was 1-2-2019. It was submitted into the make safe or demolish uh, process on, uh, I think it was July 2nd of 2019. 
Uh, the established, let me see, estimated cost of repairs to make the garage safe was estimated at $9,072. Uh, in terms of make safe or demolish eligibility, it was determined by the fact that the garage has been vacant for more than 180 days and repairs exceed uh, the building's state equalized value. Uh, the demo board did uh, hold a show cause hearing and they issued a 60 day that expired on September 25th. Um, and the issue is now obviously before uh, the city council for consideration. Scott Sanford uh, was into public safety at our last meeting. Uh, he did recommend a 60 day uh, make safe or demolish on this based on the, the fact that no permits have been pulled and no work has been done. So the show cause hearing would be set for November 18th. We have a motion before us, and even though that garage does look like it's fire damaged, it's not. It's the way it has deteriorated. So um, that's the, why the 60 days instead of the 30. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passage unan unanimously. Councilmember Hussein. The next uh, setting, let's see, the next show cause hearing actually does deal with the fire damage structure. Uh, so this would be to set a show cause hearing in consideration of orders to make safe or demolish uh, for the property at 819 uh, Cleveland Street. Again, this is a fire damage structure. Uh, the original red tag date was August 30th of 2016. Uh, it was submitted in the make safe or demolish process on uh, May 5th, no, sorry, May 3rd of 2019. Uh, the state equalized value uh, has been estimated at 24,500 and the estimated cost of repairs has been uh, determined to be about 71,400. Uh, the eligibility for the make safe or demolish uh, is determined by vacancy of property being more than 180 days and the cost of repairs exceeding the SEV. Um, again, the demo board did help, uh, hold a show cause hearing. That was on June 27th of 2019. Uh, they ordered a 30 day uh, as state statute allows for uh, with fire damage uh, structures. That expired on July 27th of 2019. Again, no work has been done, no permits have been pulled. Uh, so this has been sent to us for our review. Again, Scott Sanford uh, was into public safety and he is recommending a 30-day. Uh, the show cause hearing for this one would also be set for November 18th. Are there any questions or concerns? Uh, this particular property did not have any insurance, so uh, we do not have anything in escrow to help offset the cost. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Council Member Hussein. The last show cause uh, hearing we're looking to set is in consideration of orders to make safe or demolish for the property at 3309 Viking Road. Uh, the original red tag date was December 28th of 2018. This was submitted in the make safe or demolish on June 28th, 2019. Uh, the state equalized value is 41,000. Estimated cost of repairs is about 107,000. As you can see from the pictures, there are a number of issues. Uh, the demo board had a show cause hearing on July 25th of 2019. At that time, they did issue a, a 60 day, uh, which expired on September 25th of 2019. Uh, it was then sent to us. No permits have been pulled uh, as uh, was the case with the other two properties. Uh, and again, this is being recommended uh, by our housing inspector uh, for a 60 day make safe or demolish. Show cause hearing will be set for November 18th at 7 p.m. Are there other questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay, we are to the Committee on Public Services. Uh, Vice President Spadafore. Uh, good evening. Uh, so we have a resolution that was passed by the Committee on Public Service uh, urging the state to invest more dollars into infrastructure and change the road funding formula. This is part of the Public Service Board's recommendations on infrastructure. Um, we understand that the, the task is Herculean, but thought we'd want to go on record and, and um, the resolve section says the Lansing City Council and the administration demand a significant state government investment in Michigan's transportation infrastructure and appeals to state officials to adjust the distribution formula to better recognize road funding based on usage. I move the resolution. We have a motion on the resolution. Uh, Council Member Washington. Thank you, Madam President. Um, because this is my election year and I have talked to so many people, I think there is a huge misunderstanding that we just have all the money in the world to fix our streets and that we are just not doing it. And I certainly understand people being very upset about our roads and, and our sidewalks. But I think what, what isn't well known is that we depend on the money from the state 
to fix our roads. We do not have that kind of money in the, in the city um, budget to fix our roads. So when there are the complaints that I am hearing so much, we have to understand that at the state level, they have to pull it together and they have to find a way to give this revenue sharing back to the municipalities and the other um, so that we can fix our roads. This, thank you so much for this resolution because we need the money, we need it desperately, and they just need to find a way to get it to us so we can get our streets fixed. Vice President Spadafore and then Council Member Dunbar. Yes, I think we hear that a lot um, from all of our constituents about the roads, and I know no one likes to have orange barrels in front of their house, but we would like to s some more revenue for that. And interesting about Michigan's road formula is it's not been updated since 51. That's the legislator. 1951, um, and it treats every road in the state very similarly. So streets in the UP where there's no traffic are treated the same as Michigan Avenue, Saginaw, all those types of streets. So uh, that's why the end of this resolution encourages a better distribution formula um, that would actually pay on usage versus just simply a fact that a, a road exists. So, Councilmember Dunbar. No need to, because he just said what I was going to say. Oh, okay. <laughs> Any other comments? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Thank you. And we are to the Committee of the Whole. Vice President Spadafore. Madam President, I would move the resolution approving the collective bargaining agreement for ratification between the Capital City Labor Program, non-supervisory unit, and the City of Lansing. Um, and in that is a three-year contract that expires on June 30th, 2022. Um, this is for the... Um, police officers in the city and the non-supervisory positions in, in the police department. For each of those years, um, it's a three-year deal, you'll see a 3.0 and a 3.0 and a 2.25 raise on the salary. Um, and effective November 1, 2019, all, all folks hired into that unit will no longer be eligible for retiree health care, rather a retiree health savings plan. Uh, which will do um, quite a bit to dramatically curb the arc of the increase in expenses for our OPEB liabilities, the pension liabilities that we've talked about that have been recommended by the financial health team that have been supported by this body and the mayor's office in hiring our SRO. So we are, um, I'm sorry, our chief restructuring officer, chief strategy officer. Um, so that's all good news and very, very good. I'm glad we could see, get this deal signed. So right. I will stop talking. Do we have any other questions on that? With that, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Vice President Spadafore. The next item is uh, a resolution ratifying the collective bargaining agreement between the Capital City Labor Program's supervisory unit and the City of Lansing. I will move the resolution. Same details um, in terms of uh, three-year contract, uh, 3.0, 3.0, 2.25. Uh, raises over those three years and a November 1st effective date of the um, closure of the retiree health care benefit for new and new hires um, and there's that all right thank you are there other questions or concerns yes I would just like to say I, I do really appreciate um, the administration's efforts on these these are huge wins for the city's financial well-being and it's also huge for the for the um, the men and women in, of the police department who do who do that work I think it's important that we recognize that both sides gave and both sides got and it was at least this is a mutually beneficial win for the city and the employees of the police department um, mayor Shore. thank you I know I don't usually weigh in um, I, I want to clarify um, I, I would like to to call out Nick Tate um, who is our labor negotiator uh, and now Shelby Freyer who's our chief um, strict strategy officer, both who were involved in negotiations, in addition to the, the men and women of the CCLP, supervisory and non-supervisory, um, Tom, Krug, Tom Krug comes to mind. Um, they spent a lot of time at the table, and they all really care about not only their members, but the city of Lansing. Um, and I think this was a, a, an incredible deal they were able to, to work out. One of them was unanimous. One of them had a few no votes. But um, this was overwhelmingly supported on both sides of the table when we were able to come together. So um, I appreciate the, you know, that, that the administration was able to get this done, but Nick Tate on our office really went above and beyond. Um, this is his first year as labor negotiator, and um, so he's doing a great job. Um, so just wanted to, to give a shout out to, to him and to the labor negotiators for the, the police officers. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any other comments? 
Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. And we are to the Committee on Ways and Means. Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, we had a number of things on our agenda. One of the things we have on our agenda, and we have them on our agenda regularly, are sole source, sole source purchase agreements. And we have um, various departments come in and talk about them. We've had the police department recently come in, LPD talk about sole source agreements. We had a, we've had a sole source um, purchase agreement, economic development planning department request for info traffic parking solution for the purchase of parking digital signage solution on our agenda um, the last two times and we've extended an invitation for the parking director to come and talk to us about it and um, we will extend an invitation for a third time for him to come and talk to us about that. So with that, I'll go to our next grant acceptance which is um, 2019 Emergency Management Performance Grant. Um, this is a renewal grant that we get money um, from FEMA um, and this uh, goes into our emergency management department. 39.6% of the dollars um, goes for wages and benefits. Um, the grant amount is $65,645 um, and, it's, and it's a performance grant. The application, um, uh, the grant period is from October 9th, I'm sorry, October 1st, 2018 to September 30th, 2019. Um, but it is a performance grant and so um, we cannot get reimbursement until all the criteria um, is, is met to receive uh, reimbursement. Matching funds are cash or in kind um, and covered with existing and dedicated budgetary funding. In this case, um, it looks like it's, um, I'm, I'm sorry, the matching funds are um, cash or in kind, I apologize. Um, the fund amount is $65,645 and with that, I move the resolution to accept the grant. We have a motion. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President. Um, the next one uh, we have is a grant acceptance for domestic violence court grant. Um, this is a new grant um, for council um, put forth by our newest uh, judge on the bench. Uh, Judge Ward, who's here, and we, we um, applaud her proactivity and what she's done on this. Um, this one is um, a three-year grant from the Department of Health and Human Services um, with two one-year renewals. Okay, good. Um, and um, what it does is it's allocated to assist with um, funding of 54A District Court Specialty um, domestic violence court and it, and it will fund um, a coordinator, um, a domestic, domestic violence court coordinator and probations officer. Um, the focus is on um, the second offender or the second offense which is a misdemeanor um, and it's, it, is, it, is, um, it, will, it will allow the judge direct oversight um, over these, these uh, the folks that come through. Um, part of it is done for training conferences and most importantly, home visits. Um, it is modeled after other um, domestic violence courts in the state of Michigan, providing support for victims through this oversight. And with that, um, I will um, move the resolution for acceptance. Uh, Vice President Spadafore. I just want to real quick echo some of um, Councilmember Spitzley's um, sentiments on this issue. I really want to thank Judge Ward for um, really digging in and <laughs> reshaping a lot of the services that we can offer in the courts. And, to, and you were complimented in the committee for a lot of your work in, in single-handedly pushing this grant forward. So um, I'm happy to support it, but just really wanted to make sure you were recognized for the work yes. you're already doing in a very short period of time on the bench. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Washington. Thank you. I, I also want to speak to Judge Ward, um, to her sensitivity. Um, she knows my history, and, and I am a severe domestic violence survivor. And, um, and I did not support the last grant that came through because that was dealing with felonies. But this one is so inclusive, and it, it, mm -hmm. it, it deals with the issue 
long before it becomes a felony. And what I really appreciate about this is the fact that there's money in there for the victims mm -hmm. to make sure the victims uh, are um, actually being talked to and being made sure that that things are going well. So thank you so much for your sensitivity to come to me a month or so ago and educate me on this. And, I, and I'm really excited about this one. I'm, I'm really hoping the best for the offenders and for the victims. Maybe we can actually see some really good um, positive things come from this. So thank you. Are there other questions or concerns? Uh, Councilmember Spitzley, my question would be, is this voluntary similar to sobriety court that you um, no, it's not. You're ordered. Yeah, okay. I was going to say I Thank didn't you. think it was voluntary. And uh, then um, how long um, are they then um, being um, under the probation officer and, and the training and the things? Is that a year? You come to the podium, please. Thank you, Council President. Mm -hmm. A lot of the models from some of the mentor courts I've been working with have 24 months for probation. 24 months, okay. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Dunbar. Thank you. And I would add that um, we noticed on the application that it's an annual grant, mm -hmm. and we would, we'd asked about how long, given that it's 24 months, <coughs> ideally. Apparently, the state came to you and asked you um, to do this and, and is looking at a five-year term, um, at least for this um, phase of funding, and um, if you wanted to speak to that so that there's some continuity in the program. Yes, I was approach, approached by the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services, and the grant is a three-year grant with two one-year renewals, and they told me their expectation is that it'll be for five years. Nice. Okay, thank you. The other thing I would add is that Anethea was so impressed because mm -hmm. she wrote the whole grant herself um, and submitted it herself, and her salary is the match, so there's yeah. no money, there's no money from the city into yeah. this, and it's like, you know, almost $200,000. We don't see that often, so thank you for that. Oh, just to clarify, that isn't her salary. For anyone listening out there, the she's not making two hundred thousand dollars. I, I just want to clarify. No, that. the grant is for that, <laughs> and the match is a portion of the hours from. She probably wishes she did. Yeah. <laughs> okay, with that, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed. Passes unanimously. Councilmember Spitzley. Thank you, Madam President, and and I would ask Judge Ward that you. We have one more grant that when you left, we thought would be a good kind of coordinating grants, so I'm gonna say that one, if you could just hang on here for a second and listen to that one too. So um, the, the next one is uh, the Michigan Drug Court Grant Program, the DWI Sobriety Court. We've had this um, funding since 2005. Right. Um, and it is the felony. Mm -hmm. Yep, and it is the felony sobriety court. It's the funded amount of $40,999.15. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, but um, the city match is uh, $2,350, and I, and I believe that that city match is for, is, is, um, is um, um, employment, is, I'm sorry, I, I lost it, is, uh, is salary, thank you. Um, so we've had this since uh, uh, 2005, the Felony Sobriety Court. And so we got some um, statistics, and so they said that um, there were 196 admitted, um, 176 discharges, and 109 successful discharges. Um, there are 20 people in the program currently, and um, since between 2012 and 2016, the recidivism rate is only 6.8 percent. So that's I think that's really? very very good. So it is it is definitely working. Um, we're doing some good stuff with this DWI sobriety court and now with the domestic violence um, grant and court. I think it's, it's great what we're doing to help our residents. Um, with that, I move the resolution. We have a motion on the resolution. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Council Member Spitzley, you've Thank got you. one more. Yep. Thank you, Madam President. This is um, through the Lansing a police department, but it's the Victims of Crime Act Victims Assistance Grant. 
and it's um, it's administered through the CARE program, which is the Capital Area Response Effort administers uh, Capital Area Response Effort, and we've been doing this for 23 years. Um, it is a grant for $166,095 of a city match of $41,524 or 20%, but the match is um, made through um, volunteers, um, civilian volunteers, and we generally have 15 to 30 uh, individual volunteers throughout the year, and what we were told earlier today is that by March of any given year, we've already made our match, and so mm -hmm. um, this is definitely something that is, is worth its value. Um, the purpose of the grant is to provide local services to victims of intimate partner value, violence. Now, they talked about it used to be called domestic violence, um, but you know, seeing that sometimes it's not someone that you actually live with, they kind of carved it out and, and, and morphed it into intimate partner um, violence. Um, the grant funds three staff, um, their training and their travel, um, and it um, provides uh, listening to the victims, assesses a victim's risk of further injury, injury or homicide. It provides education on power and control behavior of assaults, personal, saving, personal safety planning, and helps to arrange safe shelter and provide advocacy with legal and civil court proceedings and assists with victims' rights compensation. That's kind of why I wanted you, and I, I, and I don't know if there's an opportunity to, um, to coordinate, but um, the CARE program is a post-arrest response team responding to victims of intimate partner violence in Lansing, East Lansing, um, and Meridian Townships and Michigan State University. Um, and again, it, um, utilizes three staff and approximately 42 volunteers on call seven days a week via the Tri-County Dispatch Center. Um, it provides available free 911 phones and arranges transportation to local community agencies and accesses other community resources available to the victims and dispenses emergency person, personal need items. And with that, um, I will move the resolution accepting the grant. I have a motion on the resolution. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay, we are to resolutions, I'm sorry, we are to ordinances for introduction. Uh, we have the following ordinance of the City of Lansing, Michigan, providing that the Code of Ordinances be amended by providing for the rezoning of a property located in the city of Lansing, Michigan, and for the revision of the district maps adopted by section 1246.02 of the code for property located at Z7 2019, 1310 Knollwood Avenue from F Commercial District to B Residential District was introduced by the Committee on Development and Planning, read a first time by its title and re is referred to the Committee on Development and Planning. Councilmember Hussein. The applicant in this case is uh, Craig Gerard of the Gallagher Law Firm. And the reason for the request is to bring the residential use of uh, this property into compliance with zoning code. Uh, there were a number of um, uh, issues discussed in development and planning today. One of those is that um, being a non-conforming um, use or, or property, it actually restricts the um, amount of money they can actually invest into this property for repairs and, and rehabilitation right. and things of that nature. I think it's actually restricted to about 35% of the building's uh, value. Uh, with that being said, uh, the surrounding land use and zoning to the north, you have single family residential, uh, it's zone B residential. Uh, to the south is a convenience store, it's zone F commercial. Uh, to the east, it's um, single family residential uh, is the current land use uh, and it's zoned F commercial. And to the west, you have single family uh, residential um, and it's zoned F commercial. Uh, so there's quite a bit of non-conforming uses in the area. Uh, in terms of the master plan, it does designate the subject property as residential corridor. And so actually F commercial will allow for a number of uses that run in direct conflict um, to the land use patterns advanced in the master plan. Um, and on the strength of that, the zoning administrator is recommending approval. The planning board did meet on October 1st, uh, and they are recommending approval as well. That was a unanimous vote. And so the uh, public hearing is set forth in the resolution would be set for November 18th at 7 p.m. Okay, uh, are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, all those in favor of setting the public hearing, say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Okay, we are to ordinances for passage uh, by the Committee on Development and Planning. 
We have an ordinance of the city of Lansing, Michigan, providing for the rezoning of a parcel of real property located in the city of Lansing, Michigan, and for the revision of the district maps adopted by section 1246.02 of the code of ordinances, Z52019521 West Hillsdale Street, rezoning from DM4 residential district to D1 professional office district is read a second time by its title. The ordinance was reported from the Committee on Development and Planning and is on the order of immediate passage. Uh, Councilmember Hussein. So it feels like forever ago that we had the public hearing on this. Um, the applicant is uh, Mr. Sean Watson. Uh, he was with us um, in development and planning uh, right through. Uh, he was uh, here, obviously, when we introduced and set the public hearing. He was here for the public hearing, so we really appreciate uh, him being with us uh, throughout that process. Uh, he had actually considered selling or renting this property uh, at one point. He was, if I uh, recall correctly, he was uh, approached by his personal attorney about potentially um, right. using this property uh, for a one attorney law office. Uh, the surrounding land use and zoning uh, to the north is single and two family residential. Uh, it's DM4 residential. Uh, to the south is two family residential, zone DM4 residential. To the east, uh, you have a vacant property as well as to the west, you have a vacant property. And to the east and west, both of those parcels of land are um, zone D1 residential. Uh, the master plan uh, designates this for downtown mixed use center edge. Uh, in terms of our zoning administrator, they are recommending approval. Uh, the planning board also recommended approval uh, unanimously. Um, if I recall correctly at the public hearing, uh, there was no commentary that was um, in, in opposition to. Uh, so with that being said, I would move um, Z5 2019 for 521 West Hillsdale Street. Are there any questions or concerns? Seeing none, roll call. On patches, passage of the ordinance, Councilmember Dunbar. Councilmember Garza. Councilmember Hussein. Councilmember Jackson. Councilmember Spadafor. Yes. Councilmember Spitzley. Yes. Councilmember Washington. Yes. Councilmember Wood. Yes. Seven yeas, zero nays. The ordinance is adopted. And we are to the order of speaker registration for public comment on city government related matters. That's the yellow sheet in the back. If you wish, wish to address the city council, uh, please jump up right now and sign that sheet. And in the meantime, we are to reports of city officers, boards, and commissions. Vice President Spadafore. Madam President, I move that all items be considered as being read in full and that the proper referrals be made by you. We have a motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. We have a letter from the city clerk regarding amendments to the board's commissions and authorities. Placed on file. The city council meeting schedule for 2020. A committee of whole. Reappointment of Tim Barron as a media representative to the Ingham County City of Lansing Community Corrections Advisory Board. Public safety. Human rights ordinance rules and guidelines for processing, investigating, mediating, conciliating, and recommending resolution of complaints. A committee of whole. Letters from the mayor regarding Act 15, 2019, Parks and Rec uh, Recreation Department proposal to acquire a parcel east of Edmore Park. A public service committee. The appointment of Deshaun Leak as the third ward member of the Board of Water and Light. Committee of Whole. Reappointments of uh, several individuals to various boards. Committee of Whole. Appointment of Martha Cerna as second ward member of the Board of Zoning Appeals. Development and Planning. Communications and petitions. Claim appeal for claim number 1720 for Ruben Montes for $518 in trash. General Services. Uh, claim number 1723, Reed Machinery, Inc. for 1,061 in trash violations. Uh, general Services. And claim number 1737, Colin Smith for $3,864 in trash violations. General Services. We are to motion of excused absence. Are there any uh, council member remarks? Council oh, member. We are to motion of excused absence. Oh, excuse yes. me. Excused <laughs> absent. <laughs> Vice President Spadaf. I move to excuse Councilmember Garza from this yeah. meeting. We have a motion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Now, Councilmember comments. <laughs> okay, Councilmember Spitzley, was that? No, no. You were just excusing. Yeah. Everybody was excusing. Okay. Um, then may, uh, remarks by the mayor. Mayor, do you have any other comments? Did you get the date of the? Okay. <laughs> I did, and thank you to Sherry. Sherry, you still here? <laughs> um, Sherry's not here. She's probably in the council office. Thank you to Sherry. Um, yeah, the, the Veterans Day um, tribute is November 11th um, at the Cooley Law School building on 300 South Capitol. At 8.30 a.m. we'll have a breakfast, and then at 10 a.m. the program 
begins. It will be uh, emceed by the wonderful Sherry Jones. Um, and uh, I'll be there, uh, Brigadier General Mike McDaniel, Associate Dean of uh, Cooley Law School and also Michigan National Guard, and then we'll have the Glen Aaron Hype Band there. Um, it's always a great event, and uh, I hope folks from the city will join us, and I appreciate you reminding me about that. It was on November 11th, so I just didn't catch it for next week, but <laughs> it'll be before the next city council. Yes, so. yes, yeah. thank you. Okay. All right, we are to public comment. We have Aaliyah Irwin and then Cynthia Ward. Aaliyah? Okay, Cynthia Ward and then Willie Williams. Thank you. Council, I wanted to share with you that there is a new Ingham County Legal Self-Help Center that is now located at the Library of Michigan, for the State Law Library, which is located at 702 West Kalamazoo Street in Lansing, Michigan. The Legal Self-Help Center is a drop-in resource center for persons who practically are self-represented, people who cannot afford to hire attorneys to uh, guide them through the court process or bring a claim on their behalf. So the Legal Help Self-Help Center is there. They, can, they will not provide legal advice, but they will provide information and referral, and um, they will provide court forms for free. Um, and they'll also direct people to specific websites that can help them navigate through their claims. So the Self-Help Center just opened last week, and I just wanted to make sure that everyone awesome. was aware of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Willie Williams and then Mary Reynolds. Good evening, everybody. Willie Williams, downtown Lansing. Uh, I missed the events part earlier in the, in the meeting. Darn, we have an event coming up next week on Tuesday. It's voting day. If you haven't already voted, people, then you're at fault if we get the wrong people in this time. Vote absentee, vote 24 hours a day, City, uh, the, the, the city clerk is doing everything in the world to help you vote. If you don't vote this time, don't blame me. Um, bets is best. And the only one I approve of so far is uh, Jackson Long for at large. Vote for them. But people... More importantly, vote. We can go in the, in the voting booth and we can vote for who we want. We don't have to vote for the bully that is telling us all kinds of stupid stuff to get us to vote for them. Because it's not Republican Democrat anymore. It's now bullies and not bullies. That's who's, who's running. And everybody on a list that's, that's eligible today is uh, either a bully or a nice person. That's what we have for Republicans and Democrats now. Bullies and nice people. I'll speak of two things for Ward 1. I'll speak of Council Member Washington, her first, her first time coming here years ago, uh, lied to me and, and uh, pulled what I, uh, what I now call a Trump doesn't even listen to public comment anymore. She's left the room. Um, she lied to me, said uh, all kinds of nasty stuff about uh, Carol Wood, and then the next year voted every single time, every single time, the way Carol Wood voted. And she's been a Republican ever since. Um, Rodiker had $123 left in her account that she's using for campaign funds. Wood had $142 left in her account from last time. Spitzley had $250 left in her account from last time. But Washington had $2,500 left from last time. What, she put, puts it in a bank, gets interest? What, 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 how does that work? Uh, goes back to the donators? What do we do with, with that sort of thing? She's making money on money. She said she would quit her full-time job. And she never did. Trump lies. I, 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 just don't, uh, I just don't do it. Thank you. And finally, we have Mary Reynolds. And she's, she's trying to get something. Y'all, 
You're done, Mary. Go back. <laughs> Time is up. <laughs> she playing. <laughs> Well, gang, you did pretty good tonight. Haven't been here to harass you. Put it back to zero, zero. Uh, <laughs> haven't been here to harass you because I had to stay home for a couple of meetings. You, I don't think you're aware of it, but you really are more on the ball than you have been in the other ones I've been hearing. You actually had some situations that had to be addressed and you addressed it in a manner of everybody didn't cave. You wanted the answers to problems that we wanted and then you asked the questions and that's good. That's really very good. I'm very proud of all of you tonight because you all did really good. And I have to go because I have to catch my cat. <laughs> <laughs> so you all have a safe week. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, we are adjourned. Just a little louder for Samantha because you know, she's just got a little bit of hearing left.